Good morning, New York. Okay, I'm going to speak uh, about the long struggle for open knowledge. I kind of almost feel I don't need to. I'm going to still introduce myself a bit, even though Stacey has done such a great job. So, I'm Rufus Pollock, and in 2004, I founded the nonprofit Open Knowledge. For those of you who don't know it, we had set ourselves a very simple mission, and the mission was to open up all public interest information and make it available to everyone so that it can create insight and drive change. And when I say, what do I mean by all public interest information? I mean all of it. I mean, where does the government spend your tax dollars? How fast is climate change happening? To kind of everyday stuff. When is the next bus arriving? Or what is the actual location of the coffee shop down the street? From the grandiose to the everyday. And we've been a pioneer and leader of the open data and open knowledge movement since we started in 2004. We wrote the original definition of what open data is, if you ever wondered. It was written in 2005, and it's still the original and the authoritative. We've opened up hundreds of data sets. Um, we've built applications. We also built the software CCAN that powers data.gov, data.gov UK, and dozens of other sites around the world that's been used to publish more than a million open data sets. But most importantly of all, we've created a network around the world now of more than 30 local groups full of organizations and individuals who work locally to open up data and see it used to create insight and change. But I'm not here today to talk to you about open knowledge, at least with a capital O and a capital K. I'm not here to talk about what we do particularly. Instead, I really want to talk about this information age in which all that glitters is bits. And why putting openness at the heart of that age is essential if we are to realize its true possibilities. To do that, I'm going to start with a story, because all good talks have a story in them. And this story is a bit old. It's a true story. It's a story I wasn't involved in, because it took place 500 years ago, and it involved two dead white men. And start the story is with this guy. Some of you may recognize him. This is Johannes Gutenberg. And in 1450, he invented this, the printing press. The printing press was the internet of its age, right? Before, it's estimated that before this press came into existence, in the whole of Europe, there were 30,000 books totally extant. 30,000. And that's a small local library today. 50 years later, by 1500, there were 10 million books. It's a bigger deal than the internet for its age. But my story is not especially about Gutenberg. It's about this guy. You'll be lucky if you recognize this guy, because he's a bit more obscure. His name is William Tyndale, and he was born, we don't even know exactly when, but probably in 1494. So he, was, he got to grow up in this new information age. right? The printing press existed. Books were getting printed. Not a lot yet. They were expensive. I don't know if you know, but the first book that Gutenberg, Gutenberg's Bible cost three years' wages to buy if you wanted to buy it. But he was young in this age, and he was scholarly. He liked his scholarship, and he became a priest. He went to Cambridge and Oxford, and he became a priest in around the 1510s. And you've got to understand, at this point in time, the Catholic Church is still indivisible. There's no Reformation. Luther's only just about to write his theses. There's one church under God. And that church is pretty big on controlling information. It is illegal on pain of death to translate the Bible into native language. It remains in Latin. And why is that? Because then the only people who have access to it are the priests preaching on Sunday. They are the people who get to interpret the word of God to the people. Now, Tyndale was an independent thinker, and he didn't really like this much. And it's told, this story is the great story told about him, that one day he got into an argument with another priest. And the priest ultimately said to him, we are better to be without God's laws, to have the people in ignorance of the scripture than without the popes. It's better that the only way they can get the scripture is via priests on a Sunday because they're the only people who read and access the Latin Bible than they would have direct access and then not obey the pope. This is knowledge power at its most direct. And what Tyndale said back to him was two parts. One I've left out, he says, I defy the pope and all his laws. Stoke one. But what he said was, I will one day cause the boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you. Tyndale made good on his promise. 
He had to leave England. It was illegal, by the way, and heretical to produce an English version of the Bible. So he fled abroad. He went to the Netherlands and then Germany. In, between 1524 and 1527, he produced an English translation of the New Testament from the Greek. And here it is. In the beginning was the word. It was smuggled back to England in the casks of merchant ships. It spread like wildfire. It was even, in fact, burnt by the Bishop of London outside of St. Paul's Cathedral. It was a heretical book. It was forbidden. But it did. It did have the effect that Tyndale wanted. One day, the plowboy did read the Bible. Tyndale did not live to see it. He worked on a translation of the Old Testament. In 1534, he was betrayed by a close friend to the authorities. He was captured, he was imprisoned, he was convicted of heresy, and he was then strangled and then burned at the stake on the 6th of October, 1536. He was just over 40 years old. So I want to take you from 500 years ago back to the future, to today, right? And I was also young at the dawn of an information age. I never got, I, when I, I went to college in the late 90s, and I'd never got to use the internet before. And one thing you don't know about me is I am a curious person. I like knowing things a lot. I think it must have driven my parents nuts, right? I love knowing things. And it was incredible. I was an information junkie, and suddenly here I was in this incredible sweet shop. I just could go around for days surfing the web. I was like in seventh heaven. And I got something. One thing I got was that I was living in a dawn of an information age. And I was going to get to live in this very special moment when suddenly all that glitters was bits. That I was going to live in this moment when the thing that was really became everything in our society in a certain way, information, could be costlessly and instantaneously shared with everyone. Wow! So the internet is pretty awesome, right? Right? Yeah, the internet's pretty awesome. But this is not another talk about why the internet is awesome. It is a talk about where the, all that glitters is bits. But the internet is not my religion. I'm not really, the internet is not enough. I'm not really a very religious person. But if I believe in anything in the digital age, it's that I believe in openness. If anything, openness is what I believe in. This talk is not about technology. This talk is about why we have to put technology, we have to put openness at the heart of this digital age if we are really to realize its potential to make a difference, to make change, to challenge injustice and inequality. Which brings me back to Tyndale. Why? Because you see, the person when I read about Tyndale and Gutenberg at school that inspired me was not Gutenberg, it was Tyndale. Sure, Gutenberg created this technology that laid the groundwork for change. And let there be light, <laughs> right? Um, does this signal something? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, so, yeah, so, so the music kind of comes up, God talks to me, you know, it's, it's one of those ones. Um, so the thing was, right, Gutenberg created this technology that it enabled change, but it wasn't in itself change. That technology, the printing press, could have just been used to churn out more Latin Bibles for priests to read out to their congregations on Sundays to tell them the word of God, more of the same. It was Tyndale who did something so radical that he was executed to it. What did he do? He translated the Bible into English. And what did he do? He opened up knowledge. By putting it in English, anyone could get access to it. He wanted to give anyone the freedom and the power to understand and interpret the scriptures for themselves, which for him, by the way, was that was knowledge, right? That for him in his day was knowledge. It was open knowledge as freedom, open knowledge as systematic change. And I'm now, I'm not religious, as I said, but... This is where I feel I'm similar to Tyndale or what inspired me, right? Which was that open knowledge, what I want is knowledge opened up to everyone and anyone to use, access, build on, share, to create insight, to drive change. I want anyone to be able to use 
create and share knowledge. Now, in the 16th century, knowledge power was the Bible, right? That's what it was. Today, in this digital, data-driven age, it's much, much more, right? It's everything from medicine to maps, sonnets to statistics. I want to open up all of that to everyone. Now, I'm just going to give one example. I'm short on time, right? I'm going to talk about medicines. Every day, millions of people on this planet take billions of pills that contain, and this is approved, I'm talking about legitimate drugs here, right? Um, that they hope are good for them, right? This is, and so we'd hope that the stuff that you're taking is obviously good for you, and you want to know what the side effects are, right? Now, we've had for a while an amazing thing in science called randomized controlled trials, clinical trials. You take a drug, you take the next best alternative, not the placebo often, right? And you see which one does better, what happens. This is a very simple test. And so we've got a really, we're in this internet age, right? We've got technology. It would be a really simple thing to take all that data on all the trials and make it available to everyone. Researchers, patients, doctors, regulators, right? It's really straightforward. We put it all online, it's open data, and we have some search on it. That isn't what happens, right? Many, many trials never even get published. Pharmaceutical companies who fund most trials have contracts which give them the choice as to where the data gets published. Particularly negative, negative results don't get published. And, um, you know, regulators who are supposed to regulate a bunch of this keep data secret or publish it. And this is true. You can go to the FDA website, publish 8,000 page PDFs, each page of which is lovingly hand scanned. Right? No find, and no find for the drug name in an 8,000-page PDF. It's really fun. Now, I'm just going to, you might think this is a joke, and I'm laughing about this. This is a real story. So, Rimin Aband comes from a great book by a guy um, called um, Ben Goldacre, in his book called Bad Pharma. It's Rimin Aband. It's a diet drug. 2007, some researchers in Norway said, let's get the data on this. They wrote to the, the Drug Authority, European Medi uh, Medicines Association, and said, hey, you've approved this. Can we get the results, please? said, no, it's commercially confidential. They're like, the drug's already on the market. What's commercially confidential? For three years, they fight, right? Two years in, they say, OK, we'll give you some data. They send them this. 60 pages of PDF with every line blanked out. <laughs> you think these guys could learn? You, know, you think the NSA could learn from these guys, right? This is the pharma industry. Guess what, though? One year, six months before they finally get access, Romanobank gets taken off the market. It's a diet drug. Turns out they cause a serious possible risk of serious psychiatric illness and suicide. So I have got a hopeful story, which is right now working with Ben Goldacre. We're building a project called Open Trials, which is all the data on all the trials linked. And it's just kicked off. So if you want to get involved in something, this is it. This is the final chance, to, not the final, the first chance to do this properly, believe it or not. OK, and I'm going to finish. I'm coming to my ending point here, which is to recap. The medium is not the message, and it's the message that matters. The printing press was amazing, and it made possible an open Bible. But it was Tyndale who opened up the Bible, and it was the openness that mattered. We've been here before. The internet has this incredible potential, right, for freedom, for collaboration, for connection. But it's potential only. Technology does not make the choice for us. We've been here before with radio, with cable. Even the printing press, right? We end up with a print media dominated by a few. Look at radio in the 1910s and 1920s. People talked about it like the internet today. It was going to be revolutionary, peer-to-peer -peer communication. Politics were going to be different. Digital democracy, well, democracy was going to arrive. And what did we get? A medium that was one way, controlled by the state, and mainly owned by vast corporations. We've been here before. You see it with cable. Digital technology can just as easily create and is creating information empires and information robber barons as it is creating digital democracy and information equality. As we stand here, we've got to think about this. Openness is key. For these things to really make a difference, we have to put openness at the heart of the information age. Openness of the net, openness of infrastructures if we really want to see change. This is a fight, make me no mistake, for the soul of the information age, and we have a choice. 
a choice between open versus closed, collaboration versus control, and empowerment versus exclusion. Versus exclusion. And the thing is, in this 21st century knowledge revolution, Tyndale is not one person, it is all of us. In choices big and small, in getting governments and corporations to open up information, in building open infrastructure, in even just choosing whether you apps that are built on open versus closed, or a social network that gives you control of your data rather than taking it from you. We all have a choice. The road is long, it's one that actually will last probably longer than our lifetimes, believe it or not, looking at history. But it is one worth fighting for. It is an information age that we want. So I ask you to choose with me. Choose openness. Choose freedom. And choose the infinite possibilities of this information age. Thank you very much.